time. We'll go over some of the things that are going on today. Of course, the first Sunday of the month, so we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper in the next service. Uh, 27th this month is work day. And that's if it cools now. <laughs> 28th is a family day. We are also having a missionary on, on that day, Keith Frank. He's been here before. Um, he is involved in an Asian national um, missionary organization, so he'll be here on the 28th. Choir practice next Wednesday, maybe. <laughs> That's the plan anyway. Uh, directory sign-up. The sign-up sheets are on the back table there on the left side. In front of the sign-up sheets, there's a piece of paper that lists every uh, form that I have. All right. Now, I'm not saying that, that you didn't turn one in, but it might have got lost in the shuffle. So make sure you look at it. If your name is not on there, uh, please fill one out or fill another one out if you already filled it out. Um, if you are a couple, if you did not put on the form your spouse's birth date and cell phone number, then you need to fill out another form. But if you if you did add that information to the first form, then I don't need. I should have when I did the forms. I should have made allowance for that. I didn't. Uh, I would like to get all of that in by maybe the third week, third Sunday this month, so that uh, I can get the names assigned to deacons in our family day deacon meeting. So if you would make sure you check the list, and if your name's not on there, fill out one of those for us, if you would please. Uh, just a quick update on the restroom project. We're still waiting for state approval. Let me rephrase that. We're still waiting for state approval. <laughs> uh, if you'll note the, on the giving, the $26,979, some changes came in for that, $1,300 in, in July. Again, just trust in the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for money, just ask you to pray, and God will provide it. All right, And I think it's going to come in as we're going to need it. So we'll just trust him for that. All right. Dan is going to come and lead us in a song. Let's stand together and turn to 302. 302.
Alright, you may be seated. It's the first Sunday in the month, so Colton's turn. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. How is everybody this morning? Good, good. Jury's still out. <laughs> if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And I'm going to be starting in verse 25. And as you're turning there, I have a question for everybody. It's a question as I was kind of preparing this sermon and God was speaking really into my heart. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? And part of the follow-up in this question is, why did you ever become a Christian? Have you ever thought about that? I was with the kids teaching upstairs a few weeks ago and we're going through Revelation, and we're almost at the end, but I stopped because once in a while you get a few outspoken troublemakers, and a question popped into my own heart, and I asked, I said, why in the world are you even here? And I couldn't help but wonder, there's times I sit and I ask myself that question. And then I think Christ has posed this question to us many times in his word, but open up. Luke chapter 14, starting verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? If it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile, it is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Bow your, word in a, bow your heads in a word of prayer with me. Father, I thank you again for just this opportunity, Lord. A privilege, Father, that I can speak the word of God, Lord, that you've laid on my heart to those that are here. And Father, I pray that today you would help us to, Lord, hear you. Lord, to have ears to hear. And Lord, whatever your word tells us, Father, to take an account, to digest it, Father. And Lord, help me just to be clear and concise with what you've given to me. And Lord, I ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to be a Christian? Again, can you think back to the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior? Can you think back to the day that you reached out to Him and said a prayer? Did you ever think of what was in the name? What it really meant to be a Christian? I think for myself, and I'm speaking for myself, but when I first was a child and I reached out and I asked, I knew I needed it. I knew I needed a Savior. I didn't quite understand everything entailed, but I don't think I needed to at the time. I just knew that God was pricking my heart and I reached out to Him. But even as a kid, I don't know if I ever counted the cost. 
I don't know if I ever sat down or realized what it was going to take to follow him. So today, I want us to look a little bit further into that. What's in the name? What is in the name as Christian? What does it mean? It means to be a disciple of Christ. In fact, we look for in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. For a whole year, Paul and Barnabas met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Disciples, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another, such as a leader or a school. And so we find, as well, it means to adhere to. And so to be a disciple means to adhere to the teaching, direction, and examples of Jesus Christ. See, it's not just that you follow that individual, or follow that school of thought, you adhere to its teachings. And for us, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means we ought to adhere to what Jesus Christ has given us. And we find that many followed Christ, but few actually adhered. Many follow Jesus based on what they want Him to be or what He can do. Look at the triumphal entry. Triumphal entry. We were just reading that in our Wednesday night devotions in our study group. The Jews believed that the Messiah would conquer their enemy and lead as an earthly king. Why did the Jews follow Christ in the mass that they did? They thought, well, here's the Messiah but they thought wrongly of whom the Messiah was. They weren't far off. In fact, when He comes again, He is going to be an earthly king. Amen? He's going to rule everything. But He had a different job when He first came. It wasn't yet that time. They also followed him because he was a miracle worker. Many followed Jesus based on the many works he could do for them. He healed those who couldn't be healed. He multiplied food and cared for those in need. The question is, why wouldn't you follow a guy like that? Right? But we got to look here at modern day Christians. The question is, why did you start following Jesus? Why do people follow Jesus? Some may follow Him just simply for the worldly or self-invented version that has been invented of Christ. Many follow Jesus, but either they actually following the Messiah of the Gospel. Many preachers today will preach about another kind of Messiah, a one who's all about love and grace, and that's true, that's one aspect. But there's nothing at all about sin. There's nothing at all about there's a right way of living. There's truth. And they hide it away. There's a kind of Jesus that everybody likes, but it's not usually the one that's really right there in Scripture. For others, He's just a blanket in times of need, picking and choosing when you need Him and when you follow Him. And that's something I think we need to think on. I have been in many times, and I think, I mean, who here has not been in a case where you look to Christ because it's the last thing you needed? Should have been the first thing. But here you are at your wit's end, and you call out to Him. Unfortunately, I've been in that case a few times in my life. You're looking you're away from Christ the entire walk with Him. But then when things get tough and He's trying to snap you back to following Him, that's usually the case, you fall on your knees and you cry and you say, Save me, help me, God. And then He saves you. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That we can walk away from the faith a little bit. We can continue to walk far from Him and that He's still there trying to get us, and then He'll find a way to make sure that we fall flat on our faces and cry out to Him. 
What a loving thing. That's discipline. We're told that he disciplines us because he loves us. But when he does that, how many times afterwards we say, God, I will never walk away from you. I've learned my lesson. And then we turn back and do the same thing again. And the next one is, is Jesus just fire insurance? For you to live your life the way you want with no regard for the cost. See, many follow Jesus. Many follow him. Many believe they follow him, but the fact of the matter is being a disciple is what we are told to be, right? The scripture tells us we ought to be disciples of Christ, and a disciple adheres. So few truly adhere and follow. In John 6, verse 66 through 69, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go, as, go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, what happens here is after Jesus poses a hard teaching to his followers, and that teaching before, if you go back into that chapter, it's a long list of Christ is telling, eat of my body and drink of my blood. And at first, you can see the grumblings going on in the crowd around him. And it goes from grumblings to arguments to backlash. And then we find here, after this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer walked with him. What was the teaching about? The teaching was about following him in body and spirit. When he's saying, eat of my body and drink of my blood, he's saying, follow my actions in what I do and follow the willingness and spirit that I have to serve God. That's what that means. How do we know? Well, if you come again when he talks about in our original scripture, Luke chapter 14 that's what the salt is. It's not some arbitrary thing that Christ puts in his teachings. When you go through here in context, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's the willingness that you have to follow Christ and adhere to his word. And if you've lost that willingness, how do you restore it back? <coughs> If what you have is Christ and God and a heart to serve Him and is everything, the cost for following Him is worth it all, but you've lost the willingness to serve afterward, after you've tasted of the greatness that is God, how do you restore it after that? And so we find... Jesus, after he poses this hard question and teaching to his followers, many of them turned and only a handful remained. I know we've had a few conversations about this before, but it's interesting to find that in almost every church you go to, you'll have many people in the church, but you'll have very few people who serve. Very few people who serve. It seems disheartening to a lot of people as well. When you look around, you see, well, I've got only this handful of people that go. But you know, Christ really is showing here that only a very few people will actually follow and serve him, will actually get their hands dirty to do the work. But in all this, the question again remains, have you counted the cost? Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 20. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This verse effectively summarizes all that God warns us going forward with being a follower of Jesus. Jesus here is saying, I'm the Messiah, Savior of the world, King of kings and Lord of lords. And here I have to find a place to rest. Can you imagine that for a second? This is God of the universe. 
King of kings, Lord of lords. And this man saying, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus turns and says, are you sure about that? Doesn't seem to be the, the, the most popular way of teaching today, does it? No, it doesn't seem like a great way to grab on the people. In fact, when I was going through this, at some point I, I couldn't help but wonder if Christ is the greatest teacher of all time, and He is, the way He shows us how we ought to even preach doesn't seem like it would fit in today's church, churches, does it? He, he kind of lays it out as this. You follow me, you follow me. <laughs> and then that's it and walks away. You follow me, you follow me. And he lays to this man who wants to follow him, I don't even have a place to rest, you sure? And that's a question that, have we counted that as a cost? Have we counted the physical cost of it? Have we counted the other costs? Again, I have to find a place to rest. It's not luxurious. It's not prestigious. I'm ridiculed, and what I have to say is not popular. Jesus was ridiculed. What he had to say was not popular. Again, look at how many people left him. And for us, that's what we need to focus on a little bit. We're in America where we don't have some of the costs a lot of other Christians in the world do before they are saved. For us, and that's kind of that question for me when I was sitting and, and just going through this and the question I'm asking myself, I'm like, Colton, what kind of cost did you really have associated with giving up? Now, when you think about it, there's a lot, isn't there? Think about, for a moment, who you were before. The people you hung out with the things you did, the things you enjoyed. Now, let me ask, was it worth the cost? For me, yes. For all of us who truly follow Christ, the answer should be yes, amen? Should be yes. We were given the well of living water, we got a taste of it, and why would we ever go back? But the question for a lot of people, sometimes, is as, even as Christians, we go forward. We get choked out, and we forget that first love. We forget the taste of who God truly is. Even more important, though, there is an eternal priceless cost. In Matthew 16, 24, verse 26, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? It answers the question that I've been asking for the first 30 minutes here. Yes, the cost is worth it. Yes, it is your own soul. See, when we decide to give up earthly things, earthly passions and desires and treasures, when we give up sin in our life, when we give up all these things, we decide then that there is an eternal cost. There was actually a great Christian um, mathematician who weighed the cost. And we use his math today. Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal was the inventor or the use of what's what called the Pascal's wager, and we use that for our probability. People use that today for gambling and other things, but imagine for a moment how he would think about that. But he used it to show that the weights and benefits of even one possibility of having a Messiah, a Lordship, your soul, and what would outweigh if you didn't follow him versus if you do follow. If it doesn't, if it isn't real versus if it happens to be real. And that probability showed that, yes, if you are, f this happens to be real, even the slightest chance 
that this is real, it, all this doesn't matter. About 1,500 years before Pascal, Paul had already reasoned that out. Have we ever thought of that? For those who know Christ, yes. But there's more than just our own souls. In Revelation chapter 20 and 21, God's Word tells us there will be a day where all will stand before Him to be judged. If you have a moment, you can turn there with me. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to be starting in verse 11. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There are only two places we're going to spend eternity. This here, and what Christ is saying, why did you become a Christian? I'm going back to this. For us as Americans, it's really hard, especially when we grow up, that to think of things spiritually, because we don't think of them in a spiritual world. We don't. We, this is a very spiritually apathetic society and culture. We don't care about the consequences, because they don't think there's a life after death. And if there is, they probably believe they're still going to go to heaven. Again, before I go forward, and a true follower of Christ is somebody who adheres to the one that is, we are discipling from. And what that means for us is that adherence to God's word adherence to God's word. And when we don't adhere to God's word, you have turned your back on Christ. You have turned from being a Christian. You say, well, Colton, I lose my salvation. No, I'm saying, were you saved in the first place? You have to finish the race. You have to continue going forward. Right? Amen? Amen? We have to continue the race going forward. This isn't a one-shot, here's my fire insurance card, I'm going there, but did you ever follow Christ? Did you ever follow Him in the first place? And so when we decide to not adhere to what God's Word says, we're deciding to say, I don't want this anymore. I don't want you, God. You begin to, begin to deny the gift that was given to us. That means when I don't adhere to when I'm supposed to stay away from sin, I'm denying Christ. When I decide that I don't want to adhere to saving my marriage, I'm denying Christ. When I decide I don't want to adhere to giving forgiveness to someone, I am denying Christ. When I decide that I am not wanting to no longer adhere to the things of God's Word in all aspects, I am denying Christ. Christ. And that's a heavy thing. That's a heavy thing. As you can imagine, as I'm reading this for myself, I found myself wondering how many times I have denied Christ. How many times when I have not adhered to his word, and at that point really decided that that apparently was when I didn't want to follow him all the way. And God forgive us for when we do. Because as we're seeing here in Revelation, 
There is an eternal consequence and cost to all of it. And that's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow a Savior. That's what it means, by the way, to needing a Savior. As He saves us when we have no ability to save ourselves. I don't know how many of you have been in front of a court or a judge, but it's a scary thing. Uh, it is, and that's a human court. You stand before the presence of somebody who ultimately has the ability to say you have your freedom or you don't. And even if you're innocent, it's a scary thing. Can you imagine the one whom we're told has the ability to destroy not just body but soul? To be before God of the universe, the ultimate judge, the one who knows there's no hiding anything. There's no defense. There isn't going to be on one side the defense trying to give their truth and the other side trying to give their truth and everybody trying to decide together what really is true and try to go from there. No, he has it plain sight, knows it all. You will stand before him naked and nothing to answer for except I'm guilty. And that's the reason we need Christ. Because when I stand before him with Christ, I'm no longer naked. I am stand before Christ clothed with what Christ has just put on me. And when he sees that, he decides and says, yes, you're guilty of all things, but because of Christ, because of my son, you no longer have to face that judgment. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it, but I gave it. And again, that's what it means to be a Christian. Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. It goes on to say, however, you thought this was all going to be depressing and doom and gloom. And... Verse 29 through verse 33. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. The promise is, again, as I had said, that when we acknowledge and adhere and follow Christ, He acknowledges us before God. On the day that we stand before God, He stands for us. And what an amazing thing that is. What an amazing gift that truly is. And so again, I ask, the cost is not just for our souls, by the way, the souls of our neighbors, our friends, and our families. I was going through, again, we're, going, we're ending now. We are at 21. We're going to 22. I don't see any of the kids in here. I think they're upstairs with Mr. Stout right now. But they all take a big sigh of relief. <laughs> they, they asked to go through, and I said, we'll try to go through the best I can, but I can't just skip whole portions. It... it, it, it it convolutes the entire thing. But we're at 21, and, and we were going through this, and I said, because the question was posed, I don't understand in chapter 20 with a lot of these things are happening, and I said, the only thing you really need to understand, the only real truth, confession time, and the confession should be for all Christians, we don't know everything. Amen? Revelation is prophecy, is not meant to know every little detail as it is. This is the truth. Can't do that. We can't. However, what we can agree on is, and in like in chapter 20, is there is a finality. That's the point of chapter 20 here, is that there is a finality of where we go is where we will end up. Who we serve, who we adhere to, there's only two, two choices here. 
couple things I have learned in, in, in Revelation chapter 21, and I want to read this with you, please, if you follow along. Chapter 21, we're going to go from verse 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who, has seated, who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I think we also could put in there, It is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. A couple things I learned in here. Notice the list here in, in verse 8. And there's many things, and, and for time's sake, I'm not going to go through them all. But the first one I notice here is the cowardly will not inherit. To be a Christian means you are not a coward. Amen? Despite what the world tells us, oh, Christians, they go in their churches and they hide. You believe in fairy tales. There's a lot of negative things. We all have heard it. We all know. But it is not cowardly to be a Christian. In fact, it's directly the opposite. And God's word tells us so right here. Cowards will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the most important thing is we see a great promise of God wiping away every tear and no more mourning. Say, well, that's great. But I think there's something a little bit greater because if you haven't thought about it, and I want us to think for a moment, those whom you love and you care for, okay? Because what we're finding here in these chapters is imagine the day we all gathered together. And what an amazing day that is, right? Amen. The day that I look forward to is when we have church every day. I heard some groans. But, <laughs> but really, it's a day every day where we get to worship God all the time. There's no more pain. There's no more sadness. The former things have passed away. It's a brand new place. And God dwells with us. What an amazing thing. What an amazing, I mean, just to imagine that. But imagine for a moment that while we're there to celebrate the marriage feast of Christ, imagine the utter devastation and sadness in not seeing your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors. Not there, and you know where their destiny was. You know that their eternity is in a place which is unintended for the souls of man. If you read throughout Scripture, and just go back to chapter 20, hell is intended for Satan and the demons. We're talking about supernatural beings for their torment and their punishment. But because of sin, that's where we are going to. And imagine getting up to heaven. Imagine being with each other and looking around. I told the kids this the other day. And I said, could you imagine if, I, if you guys got up there and you looked around and said, well, where's Colt? In, in a serious note, really. Could you imagine for a moment we get up there and we look, and I, you're looking for the, that one person you love and you don't see them. How sad. And how in the world can you be consoled that God promises you will? See, the sadness is right now for us to helpfully, hopefully push us to, to serve God, to count the cost. The cost isn't just for our own souls. It's not. 
The reason we serve and adhere to God's word no longer is just about me and my relationship with God, but now it encompasses other people. For me to be light and salt of Jesus Christ to those around me, that's important. To witness to others. You've been saved, now it's time to go and reach to other people. And then again, imagine those who you've lost in your lifetime and they have no, they didn't even accept Christ and what great sadness is, but we have a great promise and that is he will wipe away those tears. That's why it's important in chapter 21. That's why he says there will be no more mourning. That is significant. The cost of following Jesus is great. Matthew 19, 26. With man, it's impossible. It's impossible to follow God. It is. But with God, all things are possible. He enables us by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus tells us to follow him and take his yoke upon us, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we have a promise of that sadness again being overcome and taken by our God. Have you counted the cost? Are you following Jesus? Are you willing to give up everything to follow him for the sake of your soul? Are we willing to forsake sin and this world, the entrapments of this world, and focus on the gospel? Or will we be choked out by the weeds of this world? Again, think for a moment. Are we being choked out by the weeds of this world? And for some of us, I know I've heard it so many times, and I feel the same, but are you growing weary? Keep running the race. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul here gives us an example. It says, Christ too was going through the same race we all are going through. He too had to, despising the shame, knowing the suffering, kept his eyes forward on the goal and is now seated at the, next to the throne of God. We have a goal as well. And for us, I want us to remember that it is tiring. Amen? Physically and spiritually. But God promises to lift us up. Promises that we will not falter. I normally don't do this, but everybody, if you could, just bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please, for a moment. When I was talking for a moment there about imagine when we are in heaven. Imagine that day, and you look around, and there's one there that you can't, you can't, you couldn't imagine not being there with you. I have a feeling, like myself, that one, somebody in here has had somebody in their thoughts and their minds, if not multiple people. If you would just, in your own words right now, just pray to God. Ask, ask Him to help. Ask Him to give us wisdom in reaching them. Ask Him to reach them with His Spirit. And still, everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're not sure you're the one that will be in there. For me, I can't imagine just looking out at everybody here and knowing the people that I know that if I reached heaven and I looked around, I know where I'm going. But if I reached up and I didn't see one of you, how devastated I would feel. I have a genuine love and care for everybody. I do. And I pray and I hope that if right now you don't know Christ, in your own words, you would just ask God to help you. And I have a third challenge here today as we go out and as we close. If you haven't counted the cost, if you've grown weary, if you've decided that you don't remember what it was to why you became a Christian in the first place, I pray and hope that right now you do. I pray and hope you remember that there's an eternal cost that's worth everything and leaving everything behind, leaving the entanglements that we have in this world behind, and that we would take that with us today.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I do ask and pray, Lord, that you would be with each and every person here. I pray, Father, that first and foremost, they would know you. And Lord, those that are on their hearts and minds, our loved ones, Lord, our neighbors, our friends, our family, our community, Lord, we just pray that more people would come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But Father, my real heart, my challenge today is that you would help us to remember, Lord, what the cost is. Lord, what it is at stake. And Father, it's our souls. It's everyone else's souls. So Lord, help us to run this race. And so that at the end, we may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And Lord, we love you. Your will be done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you.